that says everything you've been told about the economy is wrong. That's the premise behind the new book, Unintended Consequences, which the New York Times says could be the most hated book of the year. Joining us is the author and former partner at Bain Capital, Ed Kennard. Uh, good morning, Ed. Thank you very much for joining us. How does that feel uh, for uh, the New York Times to call your book the most hated? Does it make people want to read it more or less? Well, it certainly has given it a lot of uh, publicity, so I'm appreciative of that. I think it's unfortunate that we can't have an honest conversation about the economy and have that called uh, and have that be labeled hated. You'd like to think we could get the different points of view out and let each side uh, express themselves thoroughly, which uh, is what I've tried to do. In your view, what, what has really gone wrong over the past decade? Uh, well, I, I would split that into two parts. I think that the U.S. performed extremely well from the early 1990s until the financial crisis. The U.S. economy grew 63 uh, percent, uh, uh, France grew 35, uh, Germany 22, Japan 16. We've added an enormous amount of employment, about a 40 percent increase since the mid-1980s. Europe and Japan are in the 15 to, to 20 percent range. I think that's very different than what happened in the financial crisis. I think people misunderstand the financial crisis. They think that uh, losses on no money down loans crippled the banks when, in fact, institutional depositors withdrew $1.5 trillion from our banking system despite $15 trillion of government guarantees. Had the guarantees been smaller, the withdrawals would have been bigger. They're five times bigger than the, than the loan losses, and uh, most of the loan losses were suffered by non-bank investors. So. Uh, I think that has changed, put a damper on the economy, which we could talk about in more detail if you'd like. Uh, yes, I guess the interesting aspect of all this is from your book, you, you've, you're talking about unintended and potentially dangerous consequences. Are they coming from how we handled the financial, um, financial crisis, or where are these unintended consequences coming from? Well, the, the title comes from trying to make comparisons uh, between the real world economy and theoretical economies as opposed to different real world alternatives. I try to make the argument in the book that the things that compete their way into existence against other alternatives that also uh, came into existence in the same way are quite robust and that generally our criticism of them are uh, more likely to be wrong than right and that we need to be very careful and that the best path is to make comparisons to other real world alternatives instead of just theoretical alternatives. So I think people are very quick with their criticism of the economy and not very thorough and thoughtful in trying to explore all the uh, unintended consequences of their proposals. What are real world alternatives? Uh, Europe, Japan, I think would be our best two guiding examples. Uh, I think we can also look at the U.S. Uh, historically, say in the 1970s and 80s when productivity and growth slowed down significantly. We can make comparisons to the 50s and 60s, uh, which people often do. I make an argument that our economy today is very different than the 50s and 60s and that those comparisons are, are highly misleading. Uh, you're an advocate, I understand, of tax cuts. I mean, you, you look back to the Reagan years and how uh, important uh, what Mr. Reagan did for the U.S. economy. Talk about tax cuts and that kind of environment, given where we are today with huge budget deficits in the U.S. Yeah, I, I don't advocate tax cuts because right now taxes are running at 15 percent of GDP and spending is running at 25. So I think it's quite obvious that we're going to have a very big increase across the board in the range of 70 percent if you want to make the math uh, add up. Uh, I think people are underestimating how big of an increase is required to bring the, uh, the, uh, the budget back into balance. But I do make a case in the book. I try to make a comparison between re redistributing money to the middle class and taxing successful risk takers and ask the question of which one is more beneficial to the middle class, redistribution of income from investors to consumers or increased investment by leaving the money in the hands of investors. Well, of course, we'll consume a significant amount of it, but a portion of it, about 40% will, uh, will be invested. I try to make a comparison and an argument that uh, cost reduction is more beneficial than tax increases, but 
uh, in the trade-off, I think we all recognize that politically there's going to have to be trade-offs and that uh, the, the tax reductions are not in the future. Uh, so, um, but you, um, this, it comes down to this tag that, uh, that has been given to this book about uh, this, this hated uh, discussion. There seems to be an, a lot of emphasis in the press, at least, maybe not so much in the book, but that you do come down on kind of the harder side of uh, cutting costs, uh, being aggressive, and that, you know, the whole trickle-down theory. Uh, does it work, or could it work? Well, I, I do make, I do make, a, I provide an explanation for why income inequality has risen. If you look at the economy in the 50s and 60s, it was very manufacturing focused. We were really capitalizing on the value of mass merchandised uh, goods, uh, manufactured goods like cars. We needed big uh, auto industries. We had to pave a million miles of road. We needed a big oil industry. Those uh, big companies ruled the day in scale investments. Individuals didn't matter much. Individual tax rates didn't matter much. Today. 13 people can create Instagram and a billion dollars of value in two years. And commercialization of the Internet has created a much richer set of investment opportunities. It's made our economy really driven by innovation. It's much more, much more risk-oriented. Um, individuals matter more. Individual tax rates and the payoff for successful risk-taking matter more today. And I say that is the real explanation for why we are seeing changes in, uh, in income inequality. I think if you don't see changes back to the 1950s, you kind of scratch your head, wonder why the top 1% is getting paid more, come to the conclusion that they might be manipulating uh, laws or the government or are just the, uh, 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 benefiting from fortunate circumstances that they haven't taken any risk or made any investments uh, or produced or provided any innovation that, uh, that accounts for why they're getting, getting paid more. And I'd like to get your views. You worked at Bain Capital from 1993 to 2007. I'd like to get your views on what's happening from, you know, the financial services business, Wall Street, the regulatory environment. Are we going the right way in the United States right now? Well, I think that banks face two types of risks, and, and these are conflated uh, by the by the popular uh, by you know by people. The first is that they 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 suffer the risk of loan losses or credit default risk, and it's very important that we hold banks accountable for for those risks, or they'll make unproductive and reckless loans. The second thing they they also are exposed to though is withdrawal risk which is that we had a 30% drop in real estate prices and institutional investors pulled their money out of the banking system. That was five times larger than the loan losses, uh, substantially larger than five times than the loan losses. And we woke up in 2009, recognized there's enormous uh, liquidity risk in the markets, and now money is sitting idle on the sidelines to fund potential withdrawals. Banks are reluctant to loan them. Uh, 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 borrowers are reluctant to borrow them. And as a result, the economy slows down, growth rate slows, unemployment rises. We need to put that money back to work. I don't think that our regulations and what we have done so far has focused on that problem, the problem of withdrawal risk. It's focused almost exclusively on holding the banks accountable for loan losses uh, and it has been conflated to holding the banks responsible for withdrawals. And if we do that, we've seen the movie twice before. We saw it in the 1930s and we saw it in Japan in the 1990s. Ten years of lousy growth and high unemployment. I think, and the book recommends, that we take steps to, uh, to have the government strengthen guarantees of withdrawals. They're already doing it. We need to charge banks uh, for the guarantees that we're making. And we should focus our regulatory efforts on reducing the risks of moral hazard rather than what we're doing, which is simply trying to hold the banks accountable for loan losses. We do that with the higher capital adequacy reserves and some other things. Oh. It's, it's a fairly easy problem to solve. Oh, I like easy problems. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, for I mean the loan losses. The withdrawals uh, is much harder. Uh, of course. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Ed. Francis, thank you for having me. And good luck with your book. Ed Kennard, author of Unintended Consequences and former partner at Bain Capital, where Mitt Romney was his boss.